So for this uh, second talk about uh, combustion of uh, hydrogen, we will have uh, Carl Chatelain, who is a research scientist uh, here at KAUST, who will talk about a specific aspect about the combustion of uh, hydrogen, which is detonation. Carl, when you're ready, you can start. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So welcome, everyone. So, um, so yeah, my name is Carl Chatelain. I'm a research scientist uh, in the group of uh, Diana Lacoste. So, and today I will be mainly talking about uh, hydrogen detonation, which is actually what I'm doing mainly in the lab, laser diagnostics applied to hydrogen detonation. So today I, I made my presentation in such a way that I will try to refer to, I have three objectives. So my, my first one is try to give you some insight on how hydrogen detonation could be relevant uh, for uh, carbon-free combustion, but also in a more global context of uh, energy transition. Uh, the second one is also to give you some uh, base knowledge about uh, detonation in order to, um, I mean, for you to be able to understand what are the different pictures that I decided to put on my first slide. So I hope by the end of this talk you will be able to understand at least what this picture represents and what you should be looking at when you, when you see them. And, and the last thing is uh, I will do some uh, advertisement of the, the research work that we are doing in the lab on my last section of my talk. Uh, but first, I will start with a couple of announcements. So first of all, uh, the organizer of the summer school for <laughs> giving me this opportunity to give a lecture. Uh, second one, all my co-authors that are either a part of the, of the group or, or those that are also outside of the group, either in KAUST or in uh, other labs. And first, uh, I will ask, uh, I mean, I was supposed to have a, like an interactive uh, poll system that was supposed to work, but the QR code stopped working this morning. So we'll do the old school way. So, I mean, who in the room is familiar with the concept of uh, detonation? Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> so it means a, a lot of uh, new things to learn today. So that's pretty good. So I guess if, all the other questions are, will be the same, so then I guess you are not familiar so much uh, about the typical range of speed that you can achieve in detonation or all these other questions. But I guess, um, as I said in my first slide, the key objective here is for me that at the end of this talk, you should be able at least to answer half of this question it would be great. If you can answer all of them, that would be perfect. So uh, I will start with uh, my talk then with the uh, short uh, uh, definition, because I, then all of you must be wondering what is a detonation. So the, the most common det definition that, has, that, that, is, that you can see everywhere is done by, by opposition. So de detonations are frequently opposed to deflagration, which is a conventional uh, subsonic mode of combustion, where you have a Mach number lower than one. And you have typical flame from speeds that are in the range of one meter to 100 meter per second. So when you look at the laminar uh, in this mode of combustion, that's uh, out of the mode of combustion that you have in a classical uh, laminar flame or turbulent premix flame, such as uh, you could have at home or when you do a barbecue outside. But uh, detonations are a supersonic mode of combustion uh, with a Mach number greater than one. And just to give you some numbers, so if you have a typical hydrogen air detonation uh, at initial condition of one bar, you could reach a detonation speed of around two kilometers per second and a peak pressure that goes around 30 bar. And this is it. So another, uh, pro I mean, another common definition of detonation, so it's done by opposition to deflagration, but it's also the, the detonation is a, a reaction front that is coupled with a leading shock. And that's basically what I represented here on this small schematic here. So you have the front ahead of it and the front is propagating, I mean, the reaction front that is behind is propagating at the same speed as the shunk that is ahead of it. So as you have seen, the, the, two, the, two, the two important features are really the, diff the difference in terms of speed uh, uh, that how they propagate. So now, if you are not familiar with it, you also wonder how can we achieve such a high speed? So there are quite a lot of, um, yet there are actually two main ways of uh, initiating a detonation. So the first one is called the direct initiation. So you achieve this when you provide a suffi a sufficient amount, a, a su a large amount of energy in your system, either by uh, having a powerful ignition source or laser, another detonation or shock focusing technique. 
And there are a large uh, number of criteria that has been reported in literature that give you the conditions for which you can achieve such a direct initiation. The other way is that you, it's uh, through flame acceleration, using different strategies such as steps, uh, or what's called the silken spiral, or use the surface roughness, or the reactivity enhancer to promote your reactivity of the overall mixture. So this is just an illustration of a Shilkin spiral that could be installed in a detonation tube. So it's basically here to enhance the turbulence of your system at the beginning and just accelerate your flame. In, with the same concept, so you, you can also install obstacles that have a, a specific arrangements that are uh, reported up there. So as you can see, the, the height of your obstacle with respect to the overall channel height is important, but as well as the spacing between your obstacles. And depending on all these parameters, you can achieve a, you know, more or less a short distance depending if the system is optimal. So in this talk, I will not cover so much the flame acceleration and the DDT part because they are a really a, a totally, I mean, a, a totally different uh, aspect of the research on its own. So as I have just one hour, I will not cover this in detail, but at least you have the key concept on how you could achieve detonation. So now let's move on to the uh, general context. Um, so uh, as I'm the second speaker, and as Professor Robert uh, and, uh, highlighted at the beginning of the, of the summer school, so we are all in the room, we are quite familiar about the need of combustion. So I actually recently uh, made a test uh, in, in a conference, so uh, if we are all aware of it, uh, is uh, an AI also aware of how important is a combustion? And to try to answer this, I made a simple game, so trying to ask chat GPT about what is, um, uh, to answer a question about the need for combustion with three main inputs, which was the role of the transition, uh, the, I mean, the transition to net zero carbon, the role of combustion to achieve this uh, net zero carbon emissions, and also, what is uh, the role of the circular carbon economy? So as an output, what I got is uh, something like this. So the transition towards the net zero carbon economy is crucial to limit the global warming and prevent the worst effect of climate change, which I guess in that context was actually the, the overall uh, temperature increase on Earth. The, the second output I got is the circular carbon economy and the decarbonization of industrial processes are essential to achieve this goal. So if you are not familiar with what is a circular carbon economy, so it relies on the four R, which are uh, to, to reduce the carbon. So the, the, four, the first one is reducing from its main source, so either a power plant, transportation, or, uh, or um, cooling in Saudi Arabia or warming your house. The second one is if you, if you capture CO2, you can do two things with it. So you could either reuse it as a feedstock to produce other goods, or you could also use it, uh, you could uh, reuse it directly to do what is called enhanced oil recovery. So you put it into the ground to extract more oil. And as a, as a last, the last R uh, stands for uh, remove. So you could uh, remove CO2 from the atmosphere, either by directly storing it into the ground or by, a, um, by a, a photo, a photosynthesis from the trees. And the last quote that I slightly rearranged because it was uh, actually two quotes that I merged into one was the combustion is still and will likely remain for long uh, uh, the main energy source, but its impact can be miti mitigated with uh, three things. So carbon capture, utilization, and storage, new fuels or new combustion technologies. And that's what actually brings me to where detonation could be uh, involved. It's either uh, when we use a new fuel, because as we have seen from the title, we can do hydrogen detonation, so carbon-free fuel detonation. The last one is detonation is also a new mode of combustion that could be of interest, and you will see that on the coming slide. So why, why are we interested in detonation? That, is, that must be the second burning question. So, um, so we are interested in detonation for we could be interested in detonation for power uh, generation and also propulsion. So because uh, det the detonation mode of combustion uh, enables you to achieve a higher thermal efficiency, and that's what is represented on this graph here, where you have the thermal efficiency as function of the compression ratio for three different thermodynamic cycles. So the Brighton cycle is a conventional uh, thermodynamic cycle used in gas turbine, and the Humphreys cycle is a constant volume combustion cycle, and the FJ Fick Jacob cycle is the 
is the thermodynamic cycle for uh, a detonation. And as you can see, uh, by comparing with a Brayton cycle, which is a conventional one nowadays, we can achieve increase of thermal efficiency ranging from 25 to uh, 50 percent, depending on which compression ratio you, you are operating. Uh, another advantage of uh, uh, do the, doing a hydrogen detonation is you use hydrogen. So depending on if you only consider the CO2 emissions during the combustion process or if you do a life cycle analysis, you can have either zero or net zero uh, carbon emission. So this depends how you do math. Um, hydrogen detonation also has the advantage of being a, a compact power generator because it, it produces a lot of power in a small volume. And it could be one solution among many others uh, to address uh, the non-dispatchable nature of renewable energies. So now you probably wonder, but why I've never seen detonation engines? Uh, it's probably, I mean, it's mainly because it's, oh, most of the detonation engines nowadays are still at the research levels. So you have two main categories of detonation engines. The first one is called a pulse detonation engine. And as you can see, it's operated by a, a, a frequency. So basically the ability that the user have to fill the system, ignite, purge, fill, ignite, and, and so on and so forth. So this detonation engine is fairly uh, robust and works pretty well, but it's limited by its ability to produce a constant energy output or constant thrust. So that's why there is nowadays a growing interest in what is called uh, rotating detonation engines. So in this specific engine, you have an annular uh, combustion chamber that in which you have your detonation, so that's the spot that is traveling in circle here. So you have your detonation that travels in an annular chamber and at real speed, so it, it enables you to achieve a, a constant energy production or constant thrust. And this enables you to bypass the problem of the operation frequency of the PDE. But as I just said before, so there are still, uh, all these engines are still at low uh, technology readiness level. So, and for many reasons, such as the thermal loads in long runs. So as you can see here, I mean, after a couple of seconds, I mean, the, the exit of the, of the engine is already glowing red. Some combustion instability that results from the thermal loads, mixing issues because then you have to inject your oxidizer and your, and your fuel. And also the, the, the control system that has to be uh, responsive enough because your detonation wave is traveling at two kilometers per second in your annular chamber. But even with all these challenges, so we recently, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Joe Kasara in, in Japan achieved recently a, a flight test of an RDE in space. So they put in orbit a, a device that was containing an RDE, uh, which delivered a couple of seconds of thrust in the axial uh, axis. And they also made it with the PDEs to correct some uh, radial uh, trajectories. So the proof of concept that it can fly and can be operated in space has been done. We're still not there yet, but it's in progress. So, so the second reason why people are, could be interested in, in detonations is for actually um, safety to protect humans and buildings. So, so in this specific field of research, so um, uh, it's mostly, mainly related to uh, industrial safety, either in nuclear power plants or in coal mining, where you have dust that could explode and transit to detonation. So for this, uh, the studies mainly focus on DDT, so deflagration to detonation transition, detonation in complex environment, or the quenching mechanism of the detonation. And here I'm just illustrating this point with a couple of uh, examples where either detonation has been identified or suspected. So here you have uh, in 2011 the, uh, the Fukushima uh, nuclear uh, reactor explosion, so where detonation, hydrogen detonation has been uh, identified slash of highly suspected. And, uh, and then you have a series of explosions that involve the ammonium nitrate, which is actually a fuel that can, be, that can detonate relatively easily. And uh, with the most recent accident that occurred in, uh, in Lebanon in 2020. So then, in, so all, what, how all these points are related to our uh, topic today, which is uh, carbon-free fuel. Um, and the energy transition. So first, as, as I've said before, so it can enable you, to, uh, hydrogen detonation can enable you to produce energy uh, carbon free if you just consider the combustion. Um, and in the context of transitioning 
from conventional fuel to uh, carbon-free fuel, you may also need to readdress some known problems. So known problems such as uh, 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 thermoacoustic instabilities uh, in gas turbine, as we have seen before, or also uh, super knock, that is also well known uh, for, uh, for gasoline engine. But now as, as people are trying to put hydrogen in an engine, so you can actually have a more easily detonation because you have already put hydrogen, which is that uh, detonate more easily than, uh, than gasoline. And just as a thought, so as we will try to investigate many other uh, applications or technologies, so there is also maybe we'll have to address some uh, design or rethink some design that could be seen as dangerous. So uh, here I'm just illustrating with two points. So if you take a fuel cell vehicle and represent what it is, you have a vehicle that contains 700 bar of hydrogen and you have a, a powerful electrical powertrain. So in case of a leak, so you just have a lot of hydrogen with a high thermal, I mean, a high electrical source. So I will let you guess what could happen in, in such configuration. And the second uh, trend uh, in the transition is to produce uh, e-fuels uh, e or produce green, uh, green hydrogen from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, wind, I mean, uh, from renewables, so either re uh, wind turbines or uh, photovoltaic. And in these uh, large facilities, so you have a, a large amount of renewables that are, that are used to generate uh, hydrogen and oxygen by water splitting. So which means that in this uh, gigawatt scale factory, you will have a large amount of uh, hydrogen, pure hydrogen and pure oxygen that will be generated. And this could be uh, a risk for DDT or even detonation. So now uh, I will move quickly to the detonation theory. So here is a couple of slides where uh, We'll have a bit more of a fundamental knowledge. So as I just said, it's, it's a one hour lecture. So here, if, if you are interested more by an introduction lecture, so I, I, I highly recommend you to have a look at these two books, which are really the state of the art so, uh, of the books for detonation studies. And there are also a couple of very good um, uh, review papers or either um, PhD thesis uh, papers. So, Obviously, I couldn't put all the research group working on detonation. I hope they would not get mad at me, but uh, the slides were too small. So now let's get to, into a more formal uh, de uh, definition of the detonation. So detonation waves are characterized by a coupling between a shock wave and a reaction zone, which propagates both at a supersonic velocity. So that's the, the proper definition of, of a detonation. So detonation has been discovered quite a while back, so uh, uh, almost a century and a half ago, so uh, by uh, Berthelot, Viel, and Mallard and Le Chatelier. So on the, the first two actually measured uh, the detonation speed for many fuel in, in, a, in gas phase, while the two others actually uh, focused their work on uh, the transition of the flame to detonation. And by doing so, they were able to uh, determine conditions for which you can either have a deflagrative mode for the same mixture, or you can have a detonation mode. So that's how they came up with the identifying these two modes of combustion. And, um, and detonations are actually a complex 3D phenomenon where uh, chemistry, gas dynamics, and fluid dynamics are involved. So to represent this, you have different level of uh, complexity. So either 3D numerical simulations that are really expensive and uh, very expensive in terms of computational cost and how to you have also 2D numerical simulations. Uh, so on, on, and then you have a more simpler model, which are either the 0D theory, the chapman drugge theory, or the ZND theory that, uh, that are more like a hands-on and stuff you could either do uh, uh, by, I mean, at least for the CJ theory, you could do it manually, but now you have softwares to do it and you can do that on your computer. So the main focus of the lecture will be on the on the zero D and the and the and the Z and D theory. So for the CG theory, so the which is basically the equilibrium state of a detonation. So the, the detonation has been defined by Chapman and Juge as a as a discontinuity where the detonation can be considered flat with a, a reaction that occurs at an infinitely fast reaction rate. So as such, you have an initial state where you have your thermodynamic condition that just transit instantaneously to an equilibrium condition. So, so these form, I mean, basically they, they were able to establish this theory based on the earlier equation with the jump condition. So they just basically 
with the uh, mass equation, momentum equation, and energy equation. By just rearranging the equation two and one, they were able to define what is called the Rayleigh line equation. And by uh, combining equation two, one, two, and three in a couple of steps, I mean, no, uh, they were able to get what is called the rankine huguenot equation. And you can plot actually these two lines in a PV diagram. So here you have your initial state that should be here. The pointer is not working, but basically the initial, the, um, the, the Rayleigh line uh, of the combustion product is, is drawing the path between your initial state and your combustion product. And the, and the Huguenot line uh, is here. Uh, to, to show the transient uh, on the combustion, on the products on the product side, so so the way to get your uh, chapman drouge detonation speed, you need to satisfy three criteria. So the Rayleigh line uh, and the Huguenot line needs to be tangent, which is the case here. So here I just represented half of the of the solution, which is the flow must be sonic, so which means we are on the detonation side, on the left hand side, and as such you have a constant detonation speed where both the Rayleigh line and the Huguenot are tangent. And as you have only one solution, so you can just take one of the two equations I, I just uh, showed you before, and just by rearranging it, you can, def you can derive and get your U1, which is called the chapman drouge speed, by just uh, the, the ratio of the, uh, by the difference of the, of the pressure and the, and the, and the density. And even though it looks very simple, uh, this, uh, this uh, DCJ speed is experimentally found and, uh, and it's uh, in relatively good agreement with the theory. So if you run a detonation experiment in a stable mode of propagation, you will get an agreement within 3% in most of the cases uh, with uh, this simple uh, 0D theory. So that's why it's still widely used and it's, it's important. So then, um, a bit later, so uh, came up the ZND theory that has been proposed uh, independently by Zeldovic, Van Neumann, and Doring, uh, which is based simply an extension of the CJ theory by introducing uh, the concept of what they called a double discontinuity, which simply uh, means that instead of moving fastly from state one to state two, this step will take some time and you have uh, another uh, intermediate step in, in between. So compared to the CJ, your reactions have a thickness and they are not infinitely fast. And that's what it means, the ZND theory. So now let's try to represent this uh, in, a, in, a in a diagram. So on the top end, you have what we just said before. You, you have your fresh gas on the, on the right hand side. Uh, the, the dashed line represents your, your shock. So your gas are at rest at T0, P0. Then they are compressed by the shock, so they enter in a zone that we call the, the posh shock, that is also called uh, the Van Neumann state, where you have compressed gas, but that, don't, that is, remains at this thermodynamic condition for a while before reacting. And then you have the reaction front, which is the exothermic part of the system. And then if you, are, if you let the reaction go uh, long enough, you will reach uh, the, CJ, the CJ temperature and the CJ pressure, which are the equilibrium state. Another important quantity that is often recalled in, in detonation is called the thermicity. So to not go too far into the detail, you can assume it as a heat release variable. So it is obtained uh, through this equation. And from this figure that we just obtained, so you can extract a different length scale of interest. So the first one is the induction zone length that represents the distance uh, from the shock to the maximum of the thermicity peak, which is here in a, with a green, green line. The second quantity that you can obtain is the reaction zone length, which is the distance between the shock to the uh, sonic plane, where Mach num Mach, the Mach number is equal to one. This is often uh, approximated in the literature by, the, relation, by the, the speed behind the shock over the maximum of the thermicity, but this is a detail. Um, and then you have another quantity, which is the exothermic pulse width, so which represents uh, the full width half maximum of your thermicity peak. But uh, just a, a small warning: so in, in literature, there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of misleading sentences and figures that could be found. So uh, the definition between the, the, all these terms could be you could find different definitions. That's what I'm basically trying to say. So. 
So then what is B, I mean, the, the real detonation structure as we have seen before in the animation is quite far from a 0D and a 1D. So what is beyond the CJ and the ZND theory is called, uh, I mean, the missing piece is called the cellular, uh, the cellular structure and it results from the coupling between the shock dynamics and the chemistry. And the reason why we can't get it in the ZND is because the ZND planar, planar, uh, 1D and steady, while in reality, as I have just said at the beginning, detonation are non-planar, 3D, and highly unsteady. Of course, you could get some quantities correctly, but you can't get everything. And how can we, um, how it has been observed, so, so, so it has been observed experimentally and numerically, so first I will show you an animation showing how the detonation, uh, the structure of the detonation evolves as a function of time and then here distance. So here it's for a highly uh, diluted, uh, for hydrogen oxygen highly diluted in argon. But so this is called, this technique on the left is called the Schlieren uh, sh shadowgraphy. So it basically allows you to see the density gradient uh, within your, your media. So here what you just see is basically the different, uh, the shock that is ahead of the detonation, which is represented by the thick, the thick line. And here you have other uh, compression, I mean, other waves that are uh, traveling within the system. So another way to see the cellular, so this was one way to see the, the cellular structure in the detonation. The other one was uh, through uh, soot foil measurements. So this technique is, um, is called soot foil uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a plate that you coat with carbon and you install in your rig. And when the detonation travels through it, it creates this pattern. So initially you have a, a plate that is just carbon coated with no lines on it. And after the, the experiment, you have these lines. So you will actually have a possibility to do a lab tutorial on this if you are interested by the technique, see how it works. So there is a way. So people have, have seen that. So now the question is, uh, where is it coming from? So, so this structure are actually induced by the unsteady heat release. And now the question is, where is this unsteadiness, unsteadiness coming from? And to, to illustrate a bit the point in a, in a, clear, in a clearer way, I found uh, quite relevant to use uh, simulations results. So here what you could see is the um, the normalized pressure field in a detonation that propagates. And you should be looking at, at where these three waves meet. So this is called triple point. And you can see on the animation that the pressure is at the highest at this specific location. Throughout the, throughout the thing. And another thing that you can see also is the detonations are highly cyclic and um, with a strong peak pressure at, at these specific triple points. So that's what is of interest. So if then you, you look at the history of your triple point trajectory, you can represent a pattern such as this one that we have observed on the soot foil. Basically, it means that the, the pattern you see on the soot foil is originated by the strong peak pressure that results from your triple point trajectories. And this, these lines, as they repeat themselves uh, throughout the detonation, so you you can, you can have a succession of triple point collision and so on and so forth through, throughout this axis. So, these, uh, these, um, so this is a cellular structure and it can be uh, characterized with a different, uh, different terminology. So if you look at just a single cell, so that's what I represented here on the right hand side. So you have the triple point that we just discussed where the, the three waves meet. And then you have the leading shot that is represented here in green. That is called the max stem because we're at the beginning, beginning of the cycle soon after the collision of two triple points. And on the top of the, in the bottom, you have what is called the incident shock that belongs to the cell that is on the top and at the bottom. And you have this transverse wave that are propagating here. Then if you look at the end of the, at the end of the, of the serial cycle, so you have the leading shock that are between your triple point is now called an incident shock, and it is right before the next triple point collision. So an important, two important quantities that you can obtain from this are called uh, the cell width and the cell length, uh, as represented here. Oh, sorry, I went too far. So 
So as we have seen before, so, so the, another important feature is when this, this triple point collide, they create a hot spot with the hot gases at high temperature and high pressure. And during the cellular cycle that is represented here, you have a constant uh, decay of the shock speed between two triple point collisions. And, and this has been proven either uh, experimentally with the Schlieren images that I showed you. It also has been shown uh, numerically as represented here with the evolution of the D over DCJ speed, relative speed with respect to CJ. So at the beginning, it's over CJ, and then it keeps decaying throughout, throughout the cycle. So this is just a way of saying that microscopy, the detonation travels at a constant speed, but if you look microscopically, your detonation travels at different speed at uh, each instant. And as we have said before, the structure results from the chemical and the chemical coupling. So, so how to define all these structures that we use, uh, this structure? Because they differ from, as it's chemically related, they differ from one mixture to another. So there is two possible definitions. The first one is an experimental definition that, re that is called the mixture regularity, and it's based on the observation of soot foil. So here you have three, you have, you have four examples of soot foils where with different level of regularity, you can see the, uh, the changes from one to another. And the, the theory, I mean, the people came with a, an idealized representation of this, uh, of, the, of this regularity as observed here. So you have either excellent regularity, good regularity, low regularity, or very irregular for the last case. And, uh, and all of these are due to the uh, different uh, mixture reactivity. And, and now I will just briefly introduce the second concept, which is called uh, which is a numerical concept to define the different, uh, different mixtures, which is called the activation energy. So it relies on the ZND theory that I just showed you just before. And it basically enables you to quantify uh, the reduced activation energy can be seen as an equivalent to a sensitivity analysis. So basically, if you look at how it is defined, so it's... Um, it's an, a variation of an induction delay with respect to a 1% perturbation within your system. So it's typically just a, a sensitivity analysis. And with this, it, uh, with the number you get, it enables you to plot your mixture with respect to a neutral stability curve that has been reported before in literature. And depending if you are close or not from this, you will get more or less stable mixture with different level of regularities. As this... So this, this was the first step of the theory. Then people realized that uh, it should be further extended because uh, with the, what is called the stability parameter, chi, that is a, that just enable to differentiate mixtures that have a similar reduced activation energy, but that uh, have a different uh, speed at reacting. So basically a mixture that reacts slow will have a tendency to be more stable than a mixture that reacts fast because it's more diffusive and unsteadiness is diffused over a long range, a range of time. So as you have seen on the, the two, sli two slides back, so the cell width is actually a very sensitive parameter that can enable to, to define the property of your mixture. And, and then you can find uh, in databases available online uh, where you have uh, reported different cell size as a function of your equivalence ratio. And as you can see here, you have uh, five, five different mixtures, and the value of your cell size varies a lot, depending on, on the fuel. So the cell size is a good property of your, of your detonable mixture because it's dependent on the fuel, but it's also dependent on uh, the composition. So if you vary the, how much you have fuel oxygen ratio or your dilution, you will have a different cell size. And also, if you increase your initial pressure, your cell size will vary. Um, but however, there is some limitations with the cell size uh, definition. So measurements are often experimentally dependent. And I would just ask you, how do you define a cell width on a mixture that looks like this? I mean, like a, a lot of, uh, if I give uh, 10 people in the room the, the, results, the job to do, we get 10 different results. Another thing is um, the confinement, meaning the geometry of your system may impact the cell size. And this has been, uh, and outside of this confinement, cell size measurements can be uh, geometry dependent depending on the condition we are. So this has been proven kind of recently. If you are in a 
depending on in which configuration you are, if you're in circular, triangular, or square, you can have at low pressure at least, like a very a large variation by more than a near factor of two between the square and, and the round shape. And another thing is, um, the last limitation of the cell size is values that are reported usually in literature just represent an average value. And as you have seen on maybe less extreme case, uh, cases than the irregular one, you have large variability of measurements. So by just reporting one value, you just lose part of the information on the way. Um, to, just to conclude about the, the cell structure, I, I would like to uh, make a small comment on, uh, on some detonation that can propagate and not at CJ. And this can happen in conditions for which uh, uh, you have a specific mixture uh, stability and it also depends on the, con the geometry of your system. This is just an example that is represented here. So as you have seen, so So here you have, a the first mode is called the spinning mode. So it's a stable mode that propagates at a single average speed as represented here. So here you have a transient phase at the beginning where you have your detonation that is generated. Then further your detonation fades away and you just have, instead of having this um, diamond shape on your suit plate, you just have one track that keeps repeating over and over. And this is a, a particular feature of a mode that is called the spinning mode of detonation. And this can happen uh, also in, in detonation. And then you have another mode that are called instable mode because you don't have any more a single CJ speed. You have a variation of a, a speed with a large amplitude as reported here. And also the last one in the scattering mode where the frequency of the oscillation varies, but it's the same, it's an unstable mode. So now let's, let's make a brief review on how detonation has been characterized. So, so as I've said before, so detonation have been characterized by using critical parameter, uh, but or, uh, they were reported in, in, in databases. But there were also uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of studies that characterized the, the mixture based on the propagation speed or the cell size measurements as we have just seen before. But there's actually quite a limited amount of work on optical diagnostics, uh, and this is mainly challenging due to the detonation speed that we are looking at or the high pressure environment, or the required spatial uh, and temporal resolution. So I decided to uh, differentiate the, the, the optical diagnostics in two categories. So the first one is uh, for which the data is widely available. So it's called Schlieren Shadowgraphy, or which luminescence uh, technique. And uh, sorry, these have uh, drawbacks of both being line of sight integrated. So if you're not familiar with what line, line of sight integrated means, so it means if you have uh, your detonation that travels in square domain like this, um, when you do Schlieren and shadowgraphy, you send a parallel light through your medium, and then you look how the light is, dis is disturbed uh, within the medium. But if you're looking at, uh, at the specific uh, features that are in the middle, you have, uh, you have distortion before and after that will actually affect your diagnostic. And similarly, when you do OH star combinations, uh, you have a chemiluminescence that is emitted for, from the wall volume. So if you are looking at specific structures that are in the middle, you, you will be, it will be hard for you to get the diagnostics. So in both, uh, it just means that both techniques probes the wall detonation volume and cannot, in theory, resolve the structure. But if you are, if you are in the specific cases, this can be, you can actually uh, mitigate this penalty uh, by being in a, in a narrow channel, meaning that you confine your detonation in a, in a, small, in a small domain. And by doing this, people in literature were able to uh, visualize uh, detonations uh, traveling with the Schlieren technique, either stable or less stable mixture. And even more recently, so people uh, did combine Schlieren and chemiluminescence uh, that enabled them to see the coupling between the, the shark front so here you have you are at the beginning of the of the cycle where you have a strong coupling, and here you were at the end of the cycle where you had a weak coupling. So wait one more time. So here it's is the end of the cycle. So you see you have a large distance between the chemiluminescence and the shock. 
Here it's the beginning with this, both are coupled together. And here that's again the end where you have a strong decoupling between the feminine essence and the shock. So meaning that these diagnostics are good for detonation dynamic understanding, but they are limited for quantitative information. And that's where it brings me to the second type of data available, uh, which are uh, uh, based on, uh, on laser diagnostics and for which there are limited amount of data. So here I just put some numbers about the amount of data that you can find. Um, and the difference with what we have just seen is, is that uh, it's an online of sight integrated technique and it uses a, a laser sheet to probe uh, a slice of your detonation. And this is how I represent it here. So, so here we'll focus a bit more about the basic concept of LIF, which is one of the techniques uh, that uh, we used here. So it's based on, uh, so the first step of the technique is you excite the molecule with a laser in your slice. So the molecule are excited and absorb energy. Then the, the, the laser is off uh, after a while. And then the, your molecules that, be, that absorb the energy are in the excited state. And then, it, then they release uh, they release energy by emitting light, and that's what we call the fluorescent process, and that's what we collect. As you have seen, as we have excited in a specific volume here within our laser sheet, the light that we collect is also from this specific volume. So which means that compared to the other techniques, we really probe a small volume within our system. And these techniques have actually been employed in combination with Schlieren in the, in the literature, and we're able to characterize uh, different mixtures uh, uh, based on, on their stability. So here is just an example of a highly stable mixture, highly diluted in argon, and here with a, with a less stable mixture, with a less level of dilution, you can see that both structures are extremely different and you have even presence of uh, unburned pocket. Uh, a, a last point that I want to make about the, the, the the measurements that have been done in literature using laser diagnostic is 2D temperature measurement. So recently, uh, people conducted a 2D color OH brief in a square channel. So I will not go through the detail of the diagnostics here because you will probably have a better uh, class for this uh, later this week. But the concept is by using two different laser excitation wavelengths, if you do the ratio of the fluorescence, if you choose carefully your wavelength and do the ratio of your two signal, you could get back to the temperature measurements. And that's what they did. So they were able to obtain a 2D temperature field uh, within the detonation. And they found out, they correlated, I mean, they plotted the distribution of their temperature profile with respect to the CJ temperature. So they could see that their measurements agree well with TCJ, but it does not resolve the reaction zone or the temperature rise that we define, remember, in the ZD ditch structure. So you have the induction time and then you have the temperature rise, but they were not able to capture it. Uh, however, they revealed a cold temperature region near the unburned pocket, and, but at the end, this only gives you CJ information and you can't resolve the structure. So here I'm just making a small comment on all I've just said with the low number of papers that uh, I've reported. So here my, the review I made was really focused on hydrogen detonation in a, in a canonical configuration, meaning in a straight tube with hydrogen fuel. If you go outside of these boundaries, you look at uh, measurements done in a, in a detonation engine or measurement done with hydrocarbon, you will find other uh, laser diagnostics paper uh, in detonation. But just the rule of a thumb, even if you consider all this, so if you look into the deflagration community, which brief papers you can find more than 1,000 paper, while in detonation you will just get 30. And, oops, sorry. And for the NO brief papers, you will probably find around the same figure, but uh, for detonation papers, there is only two papers uh, available in literature. So now I will focus a bit more on the work uh, we are doing in KAUST in terms of uh, laser diagnostics. So but before doing that, I will just recall you how um, detonations are simulated. So we have seen together uh, a bit earlier that detonation can be simulated by the 0D theory, ZND theory, or 2D, 3D numerical simulations. But there is one thing I didn't mention is um, the motivation uh, why we want to do uh, optical diagnostics in detonation is because numerical simulation nowadays with detailed chemistry are not able to reproduce quantity, uh, the cell width properly without adjustment. And this is typically uh, a comparison I want to show you. So on the top you have a numerical, uh, an experimental suit foil 
And at the bottom, you have an experimental, um, a numerical, sorry, a suit fold that, that is obtained. Uh, and you can see that you have a mismatch around a factor of two. And this mismatch is actually observed in literature for all the people using uh, detailed chemistry, except those that used uh, one-step chemistry, which is actually a chemical model that is adjusted to match the cell size. So obviously, at the end, they replicate the cell size. But if they use detailed, uh, is there everybody obtained within a factor of two to four, uh, depending. And this basically tells us that the cell size is actually not a good validation target because even with detailed chemistry, we can replicate it. And it results, it's like the end of the story. So you look at something that is already, uh, that is like looking at the flame temperature when you try to calibrate the uh, chemical model. So, it's, so, so then we came with this, uh, this reasoning of there is a lack of uh, reliable quantitative data in detonation. Uh, studies, so that's why we build our uh, optical detonation rig to try to address uh, this problem. Um, and it's a basically a, a rectangular channel which has different sections. It's highly, highly modular, so we can change the, the section, we can change the length. Um, it can be represented as three main sections. So you have the first section that, sorry, that aims to gen generate the um, the detonation here, then you have a stabilization section, and then you have a section with optical access. Um, in addition to that, so it can be, you can either install suit foil or optical access, depending on the needs, so it's quite convenient. So once your mixture is ready, so the only thing you have to do is to ignite uh, with a spark plug. So you have then a weak flame that is generated on the left-hand side, and then you have fl the flame that travels to the other side of the rig that is accelerated by the obstacles that are represented here. And at the end of the obstacle section, you should get a detonation that then that stabilizes to the CJ value and travel to the end of the rig. And once it's reached, it reaches this pressure sensor or on another, we trigger our laser system in order to synchronize the full thing and get the laser sheet at the moment where the detonation is. So I will briefly uh, summarize how the laser. Uh, the two techniques that we're using, so it's either OHPLIF or NOPLIF, they are quite similar, so I will just go quite quickly through it, but in both cases, we use uh, a conventional dye laser system. So for the OH, we target the, uh, the wavelength that is at 284. We have a, a quite a large energy available, around 15 millijoule, and we use laser sheets that are in the range of 5 centimeter uh, per 0.3 millimeter thick. For the image collection, we used intensified camera with a <laughs> pixel density that is in the range of uh, 40 micrometer per pixel, so it's pretty good. And all the images we obtain are background and energy profile corrected. So for the NOPLIF, we use, uh, again, the same dummy laser system, which is put in a slightly different configuration uh, in which we do uh, wave mixing. In that case, we have significantly uh, less energy available. Uh, that's why we used a slightly uh, smaller, uh, we, we used first a beam to, do, to demonstrate the technique, and then we used a smaller laser sheet to have access to a smaller field of view. And uh, because we looked at the smaller uh, things, so we achieved, we were also looking at the, with the camera at a smaller field of view in order to have a good special resolution. So, um, so I, I will go through a couple of studies that we have done. So I identified four of them. Uh, maybe I think I will skip one because of uh, time constraint. Um, but one thing that from the previous work that has been done in literature, um, you, you, I mean, s several um, problems uh, have been identified in the OHPLIF. And basically what we have done in the first OHPLIF study, we tried to address the, this limitation. The limitation uh, were, uh, reported by Mevel and co-authors. So the evidence that the OH-PLIF uh, image that you obtain cannot be compared directly with the OH number density. And this is basically what is represented here on this figure. So if you plot the experimental uh, leaf signal and you compare it with the OH mole fraction, you see there is a big gap. And similarly, if you do 2D simulation, you cannot compare them. And you need to uh, simulate the, the phenomenon to be able to uh, to understand what you observe on your leaf image with what are on the field that you simulate. 
And this is due mainly to a strong laser absorption that leads to a non-physical imaging of your front. So the absorption of your laser is due to the strong OH pocket ahead. And as you can see, you have an attenuation of your laser behind it. So we did the first uh, thing, but I will not cover it because of time constraint. But the, the second strategy we did to try to mitigate this problem of attenuation of the laser is to change the laser excitation wavelength. Because to give you a bit of context, so we wanted to identify an alternative excitation trust strategy to have laser absorption, because most of the people uh, used only a single laser excitation strategy in the, in the literature, which was at this wavelength, so 24 nanometer. And so we, we did replicate the, the same imaging. We used also another uh, Anyway, so on the right hand side you have the conventional line that has been used in literature. And on the left hand side you have another line that is commonly used in subsonic uh, uh, diagnostics. And as you can see, in both cases, you have the same problem repeating again. So you have a lift signal drop rapidly after your front. So we decided to, to select other uh, laser wavelengths um, to see if we could uh, suppress the problem. And we actually succeeded by just selecting uh, two other uh, uh, laser excitation wavelengths that were nearby by just minimizing the absorption cross-section of OH. And as you can see, on the, on the two strategies, so excitation one and two, we're able to obtain a lift signal quite far uh, down from the front. So now I will move on to the NO lift uh, diagnostics. So what, so, so what we, so the only issue with this uh, last uh, diagnostic is we don't see the shock. So we only see where is uh, located the reaction from. And we can't uh, characterize the reaction zone as we don't have the location of the front ahead of it. So we, we came up with trying to identify a new diagnostic that we could employ that could enable us to characterize the reaction zone. If you remember, the reaction zone is uh, the distance, uh, I mean, it, it starts from the shock. So we need to find a diagnostic that, that enables us to, to see the, the shock and then the, the reaction zone or the beginning of the reaction zone with the heat release behind it. But the problem is, uh, we wanted to use NOPLIF, but there was no prior usage of it. So we had to do a numerical investigation to see what was the best strategy to enable this diagnostic. And we came up with the, with the so we, we confirmed that it's possible by seeding the mixture uh, with 2000 ppm of NO. And this slide here is just to uh, just demonstrate, as you change the mixture composition, we have seen a couple of slides back that cell size and the properties of your detonation are highly sensitive to your mixture. So we just here basically did a small check on um, the absence of any impact of the, of the 2000 ppm of NO. This is what you see on the right hand side. So you have the cell size with and without uh, NO, the experimental cell size with and without NO, and you can see that even when you measure it, you don't have a, a strong effect of the NO addition. So then, the, the, as we know that there is no chemical effect, so we did the diagnostics. So what we did is we were able to correlate the leaf signal evolution with the induction zone length that I defined you earlier. Um, and uh, by doing that, we checked that our coloration was working for a wide, wide range of condition or from uh, different uh, equivalence ratio, different pressure. And in average, we're getting an error at predicting this value around 3%. So now, we co after that, we conducted the measurements. And this is a kind of 1D beam profile that we obtain. So depending at which instant within the cellular cycle you are, as I showed you before, you are at the beginning, you are, you are at a strong thermodynamic condition. So your induction zone is short. And if you are later in the cycle, you have uh, an induction zone that is longer. Um, but the, unfortunately, uh, we were hoping to be able to get uh, information on the structure of the front from the chemical essence. So this is here represented on the, but with the color scale, it's the leaf signal, and with the gray scale, is represented the white star chemical essence. Uh, but we couldn't represent, uh, we couldn't get information out of it because if you look carefully on this image on the right with the circle, you have your chemiluminescence at the location of the induction zone length, which is impossible based on the ZND theory, which means what we are seeing is a chemiluminescence outside of the plane of our, of our, um, of our, of our laser sheet. So then what we did is simply conducted uh, a lot of single shot measurements and tried to get information uh, 
out of all of this. So what we saw is a large variability of the induction zone length throughout the shots. Uh, we saw that the value we obtained was actually quite close from the, predict the one predicted from the ZND theory. And also we were able to uh, confirm that the, the variability of the, of the induction zone length is actually in agreement with the variability, uh, which is qualitatively in agreement with the variability of the speed observed uh, throughout the cellular cycle. So this was quite uh, promising, but we were still uh, lacking the need to get uh, the structural information. And that's basically what we did then. We extended the diagnostics to an OPLIF to see better uh, the, the reaction zone structure. This is a typical image that we obtained. So if you remember from the cellular uh, structure, so you have here represented uh, a max stem. Here you have a thicker induction zone and then another max stem, induction zone, another max stem. So by multiplying the shots here again, uh, we were able to reconstruct the evolution of the detonation structure um, from a single shot imaging. And uh, what is represented here on the green is the track of your triple points as you would have if you were doing a suit foil imaging. And here you have uh, a small induction zone length that is getting thicker and thicker uh, throughout the cellular structure. So, so these uh, measurements, I mean, were, were not obtained before. I mean, uh, uh, at least with the uh, NOPLIF, because we're the one developing the technique and the one obtaining this, these measurements here. And in addition to that, so just what I just said, so we, if you plot the evolution of the induction zone, so this thickness of this white layer here as a function of the distance between the gray uh, triple point, green triple point path, you can see the evolution on the right-hand side here of the induction zone length as a function of the triple point. So this was quite nice, uh, um, and um, basically it confirms the first uh, feeling we had with the 1D uh, measurements. Uh, in addition, we're able to reconstruct the, the evolution of the of the structure, the, I mean, the evolution of the detonation structure with multiple shots. Um, I, I still have 15 minutes, right? Okay. So then the the, um, the question that remains is, can it be extended to other fuels? And that's uh, one of the question. Uh, we are currently trying to answer. Uh, so uh, we did some numerical tests. So it seems like, so first of all, we did a test like, until which can we add NO before it starts to impact the chemistry of the mixture? So we saw that until 1%, it seems to be pretty good. However, one drawback is from ZND simulation. It seems like, depending on which mixture, this 1% rule cannot be applied to every, every mixture. So it needs to be done carefully. Um, and also, uh, uh, quite a relief, but it seems like you can perform induction zone length measurements for nearly any fuel as long as you choose a small enough NO concentration in your in your seeding mixture, even at higher pressure. However, the two limitations are if you have a fuel that produces a lot of NOx, either through the uh, fuel NOx or if it's uh, uh, if you use uh, the NOx as oxidizer like NO2 or NO, you will not be able to use the diagnostics. And this is just an illustration of the correlation that, to show that the correlation at high pressure is still working. But uh, all these are mainly done numerically, so we need to confirm them uh, experimentally. So, aside from the NOPLIF uh, 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 diagnostic on, on itself, uh, we tried also to conduct a recently simultaneous OH and NOPLIF uh, imaging in hydrogen detonation. And that's actually, uh, that's actually the images you saw on the first slide. So what you have to understand here is, so these two images uh, were obtained simultaneously uh, with, um, in the detonation uh, wave. So you, need, you have two cameras, you have two beams uh, sent to the laser, and all of this is synchronized in such a way that you, have, you can capture your detonation that travels at two kilometers per second in a rig, and you have set a camera with an integration time scales in the nanosecond range. So it's, it's not so complicated once you know how to do it, but it needs, to, it needs some experience. So here is just a small comment about like we, have, we had to change because we, we did that with a single dye laser, so we had to adapt a bit our excitation strategy to make it work. Uh, a small comment about this is 
Nevertheless, even if the, if the, 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 the excitation wavelengths are slightly different, they still characterize well the reaction zone, they still characterize well the induction zone, so meaning that the induction zone length measurements could be achieved also. Another interesting thing is, if you look carefully on these two images, uh, it seems like the NOPLIF uh, diagnostics seems as good as combining both the Schlieren and the OHPLIF uh, technique, because you can well resolve the, um, the position of the shark and the beginning of the reaction zone. Because if you look, like the image on the left is actually a perfect uh, print of, the, of, of what you have on the right-hand side. So this is uh, quite nice and needs to be, of course, further confirmed, but this is a work in progress. And, um, and another thing that, we, that I don't fully discuss here, but by combining both information, we are able to see the position of the shark, the, indu the, 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 length, the induction zone length, the reaction zone front location for each measurement, so which, is, uh, which is quite an achievement. And then I will just conclude uh, this, the work that we are, we are doing here with, uh, if you remember, the objective of all of this at the beginning, which was to compare experiments and simulation. So this is uh, also a work in progress, kind of, but here we are comparing um, qualitatively simulation results with the NOPLIF images that we obtain. So this has been done with open form solvers that are currently, that has been validated recently. So for both the simulation and the experiment, we use conditions that were near CJs. And uh, we post-process the NO field, as I've showed you before for the OH. So you post-process the NO field that you obtain from numerical simulations. Um, then it gives you a numerical NOPLIF images, and you compare this NOPLIF image with the experimental results that are presented here. And if you look just specifically on one of the lines, so line A, which represents here an incident shark, you can clearly see that you have a very good agreement between the experimental profile and the simulated profile with the spectroscopic code. Uh, code. So the, the only uh, issue here is you still need to, to, to post-process your simulation result to make the comparison, but, uh, sorry, we have a satisfactory uh, good agreement and more discussion about the induction length and everything will be presented in a, in a coming conference. So now I will just conclude with some takeaways. So I hope with this presentation at least you have a kind of a, a bit of a better uh, understanding on uh, what could be the role of hydrogen uh, detonation uh, in the current context of uh, energy transition. Uh, the, I hope you will at least uh, remember that hydrogen is a supersonic mode of combustion uh, and it is a uh, highly unsteady and a 3D by nature. Um, that the state of the art at the moment cannot replicate the numerical simulation with detailed chemistry, and that's why we are uh, currently trying to uh, develop some laser-based diagnostics uh, to provide more quantitative information uh, to the community. And with this, uh, I will conclude my slides with my opening slide, and I hope that at least you could grasp a bit of all this information now next time you see them. Thank you, Carl. Do we have any questions for Carl? Okay, do you understand everything? We can ask a question also, so be careful. Okay, I have a question for you. So um, you talk about this uh, detonation and you showed this example of uh, detonation uh, rotating detonation engine in space. Uh, is there any research on trying to use this uh, rotating detonation engines in, uh, for uh, gas turbine applications such as to link with the presentation from uh, Dr. Hassan this morning? I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of the idea of uh, some people, what they are doing, trying to see the... First, they are still working on trying to get the efficiency, trying to get a, a figure, because right now everything is related on the theoretical, idealized uh, ficket jacob cycle, but no one yet provided uh, thermal efficiency of an RDE. So people are working on that, and one of the things they realize is when they start to add something at the outlet, either to, to guide the flow or stuff like this, they start to lose efficiency or they have problems in stabilizing their system. 
So I suspect that's why part of the research uh, is integration into a gas turbine might be driven by this as well, like trying to see the shape of the, of the outlet of the uh, RDE, see how they can modify it in such a way they can either improve the trust or improve the energy conversion. But uh, still really fundamental yet, I would say. Still no question? Okay. If there is no question, just to, to start to make a bit of teaser, uh, we will have this lab tutorials on uh, Wednesday. Yeah, when I say there is one about measuring cell size detonation. So if you are interested, just register for this lab tutorial. I will say a few more words about that uh, at the beginning of the women in combustion session. So let's thank Carl again. <laughs>